Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just posted a couple of days ago on, on where I, I, I actually am very lucky to the intersection of three different businesses. I'm a teacher first. I love to write. And I'm in finance. And the way I described it, I'm in three businesses that are all begging to be disrupted. Three really big, badly run businesses, all of which need to be taken to the cleaners. So I've made it my objective at this point in my life to disrupt the businesses I'm in. And this is one of those acts of disruption because I think for too long we've thought about teaching as being classrooms and universities, but I don't see that restriction anymore. So what I'd like to talk about is actually what I've been teaching for 30 years. To give you some background, I came to NYU in 1986. And when I first came to NYU, they gave me a class to teach. It was called Security Analysis. And for those of you who know the history of that class, it was a class that Ben Graham taught at Columbia in the 1950s that you know who, he who shall not be named took. And it's a class with a long and hoary tradition. So they handed it to me and said, you've got to teach this class. I took one look at the class and said, no way. This is the most boring piece of collection of topics I can think of. Because by the 1980s, it was showing its age. So I went to the head of the department and said, I'd like to teach a valuation class. And he said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to actually teach a class. And you know what? In 1986, there wasn't enough stuff in valuation. There were no books in valuation. In fact, when I did my MBA, which was way, way, way back in time, 1979 through 81, two years of the program, we spent about an hour and a half collectively on valuation. So I thought about it, and I said, I'd really like to teach the class. And I considered two options. One is to go the official route in the university, which is to ask officially for the class to be OK. And if you've ever been in an academic setting, as most of you have, you know how difficult it is to get things done officially at a university. A committee would be formed to report another subcommittee. And by the time they get packed to you, it'll be, you'd be ready to retire. So I discovered early on in my academic life that if you want to get something done, it's best to do it subversively. So here's what I did. I said, OK, I'll teach a security analysis class. And I went into the classroom, and I taught a valuation class. <laughs> they have absolutely no idea what I do in the classroom. <laughs> I mean, I could be teaching cooking for all they know, right? So you know how long it took them to find out? In 2008, I got a call from the dean's office. This is 22 years after <laughs> I've been teaching this class, saying, we've heard you teaching a valuation class. And I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. He said, we should call it valuation. I said, welcome <laughs> to reality. So if you look at the NYU schedule, you won't see valuation until 2008. But that's because I've hijacked like six other classes in previous iterations and made them all valuation classes. I'm fascinated by valuation. But I'll tell you up front what I think about valuation. I think valuation is simple. Fundamentally, anybody can do valuation. I think we choose to make it complex. Who's we? The people who practice valuation. Why? Because that's how you make a living. You've got to cover things up with layers of complexity, keep people away. So I want to get back to basics. Obviously, in 40 minutes, I'm not going to cover the details of valuation, but I want to kind of hit some points that I think sometimes get missed, especially when people look at valuation from the outside. So here's the first message I want to deliver. Valuation is not accounting. And the reason I say that is most people, if you say valuation, think numbers, think accounting statements, think income, balance sheets. Valuation is not accounting. And it's actually a task I face every year I teach this class. In fact, many of the MBAs that I teach come into my class in the first year in the spring semester. When they come in, in the spring semester, they've taken one class in accounting. And if you've, if, you've, uh, if you've looked at how MBA programs have evolved, MBA programs are very diverse now. I get museum directors. I get basketball players. So to them, the only s sense of finance they've had is the accounting class. And part of my job is to get them out of the accounting mindset. So let me start off by explaining the way I see the difference between how accountants look at the world and how finance looks at the world. Accounting is backward looking. Nothing bad about them. So nothing I say should be viewed as, a, as bad. It's their job to record what's happened. So if you look at a balance sheet, and most of you, if you open up a 10K or an annual report, will see a balance sheet. This is a classic accounting balance sheet. So let me look at, let me look at the breakdown of how accountants break down a company. On the asset side, 
they break assets down into current assets, basically inventory, accounts receivable, cash, fixed assets, land, building, equipment. Accountants are big on tangible fixed assets. For some reason, if they can see it, they're much more comfortable with it. Then you have financial assets, investments in other companies. And then you have what accountants euphemistically like to call intangible assets. Now, if, if I went around this room and asked people to name intangible assets, you'd see lots of things come to the surface, brand name, technology. But if you look at an accounting balance sheet, you know what the most common intangible asset is? Goodwill. And let's be completely clear about this. Goodwill is the most useless <laughs> asset known to man. And here's why. For goodwill to manifest it, uh, itself on an accounting balance sheet, do you know what a company has to do? It has to acquire another company. So if you're the greatest company on the face of the earth and you've grown entirely with internal investments, there will be no goodwill on your balance sheet, period. The minute you do an acquisition, goodwill pops up. And here's why it pops up. You acquire a company, it has a book value of $4 billion. So what did the accountant say until just before you acquired it? It's worth $4 billion, it's worth $4 billion, you offer $10 billion. <laughs> The accountant has a $6 billion problem to explain away, right? So you know what he does? He calls it goodwill, he puts it on the balance sheet, and he has to do it because the balance sheet has this very unpleasant requirement. It has to balance. <laughs> goodwill is a plug variable. The problem with goodwill is it sounds good. And when something sounds good, people feel the urge to pay for it. So every week I get emails from people saying, I'm valuing this company, it has five billion in goodwill, how much should I pay for it? And my response is, it's a plug variable. What the heck are you doing paying for a plug variable? On the other side of the balance sheet, again, accountants get carried away. You have current liabilities, accounts payable, supplier credit, deferred taxes, so all kinds of stuff. Then you've got long-term liabilities, bank loans, corporate bonds, and then you have an item that's called shareholders' equity. If you get a chance, take Google, look at the balance sheet. There will be a shareholder's equity number. Take any company, there's a shareholder's equity number. You know what goes into it? Everything that's happened to this, this company over its lifetime. Think about it. When you look at the shareholder's equity for Coca-Cola, in that number is the original public offering that Coca-Cola made, which was, what, 100 years ago? And everything that has happened since. The shareholder's equity is a reflection of the past. So here's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to replace it with what I prefer to look at a company as, a financial balance sheet. And in my, at, at some level, a financial balance sheet is far simpler than an accounting balance sheet. At another level, it's far more complex. Look at the assets out of the balance sheet. There are only two items, assets in place and growth assets. Let's take the easier half of that. Assets in place are investments you've already made as a company. That's pretty straightforward, right? It's the value of investments you've already made. Pick any company you want, think about the investments they've already made. Growth assets is a little messier. It's a value I'm attaching to investments I expect you to make next year, two years out, five years out, 10 years out, forever. I'm giving you credit for investments you haven't even thought about yet. That's pretty scary, right? An accountant can never do that, but I play by no rules. So if I feel that you have great investments in the future, I can give you a large value. Let's look at a contrast. You look at Procter & Gamble. Where's most of the value for the company coming from? Investments they've already made or growth assets? Most of the stuff they've done is already on the ground. What else are they going to do? But if you look at a LinkedIn, and you can pick any young growth company, and I'm not going to pick them in terms of quality. Just think of any young growth company. On a good day, maybe LinkedIn's Assets in place are worth a billion because they made about $10 million in operating income last year. You're paying $40 billion for the company. The extra $39 billion is for what? Expectations, perceptions, hopes. Nothing wrong with it. But that's a first stop when you're an investor. You've got to stop and do a reality check. What are you buying when you buy this company? Because the way you assess the company is going to be very different if it's Procter & Gamble as opposed to LinkedIn. If you're Procter & Gamble, you should be very focused on earnings reports and say, how much did they make last year? If you're LinkedIn, who cares what they made last year? That's why when I see investors freak out over earnings reports from young companies, and there are lots of them, right? Take any social media company, look at how they freak out. Earnings, the earnings per share were two cents below expectations. I 
don't care because the value of your company is not coming from what you did last year. It's coming from what I think you can do in the future. So when I look at an earnings report for Twitter, I'm not looking at what did they do last year. I'm looking for clues as to is their growth potential increasing or not? Are they doing the right things to create value from their growth assets? Most of the tools we have in finance were developed for mature companies. PE ratios, return on invested capital, things you're taught in business school. But if you have a growth company, you try to assess them using those tools, it's like using a hammer to do surgery. Think about it. That's going to be bloody and it's going to come to a bad, a bad end. It doesn't work. So one interesting thing you can do when you sit with a business is take the accounting balance sheet and contrast with the financial balance sheet. The younger a company, the less you will learn by looking at the accounting balance sheet for a simple reason. If you haven't been around long, the accountant has nothing to record. So you look at a Twitter's balance sheet or a LinkedIn's balance sheet, there isn't much there yet. Doesn't make them a bad, bad companies, it just makes them different. And on the other side of the balance sheet, you've got only two items, debt and equity. There are only two ways you can fund a business. You can borrow the money or use your own money. You can slice this and dice this as much as you want. You can call them bonds and stocks, but every business has to have that choice. And guess what? You tell me where the bulk of your value comes from, I'll tell you whether you should be funding your business with debt or equity. And think of what? Let's say you're a young growth business. How young? You're an idea business. You're Snapchat. No revenues yet, no earnings yet, plenty of potential. How should you fund your business? What's the problem with borrowing money to fund an idea business? Have you tried paying interest with ideas? Go to the banker and say, you know what, I have a lot of ideas. You can't make interest payments with ideas. If you're an idea business, this is Corporate Finance 101. Don't go looking for trouble. You have to raise equity. So that's the first message I want to deliver. Here's the second one. I often see valuation classes structured around spreadsheets. In fact, some of you might have sat in one of these classes by training the street. I like those guys. They come in with spreadsheets. They teach you how to be an Excel ninja. You can write macros on top of macros. You can do those, you know, the, those shortcuts and turn you know, columns into yellow, green, blue, etc. And at the end of two days, you are a master at Excel. And you think this is what valuation is about at the end of the process. In fact, the way I like to describe this is to step back and think about what drives the value of a company. If I'm asked to value a company, there are four basic questions to which I need answers. Here's the first one. You've already made those investments in the ground. What are the cash flows you're getting from those existing investments? Could be very small if you're a young growth company, but that's my starting point. That's why I look at the last financial statements, to get a measure of what your existing cash flows are. The second question I'm going to ask you is, what is the value that I see you creating with future growth? Notice how I phrase the question. I'm going to ask you, what's your future growth? Growth by itself can be worth a lot, can be worth nothing, or can destroy value. Growth can be good, bad, or neutral, because you've got to pay for growth. So I'm going to ask, what's the value you create from future growth? Much more difficult than to answer then, what are your cash flows from existing assets? But I need that answer. Third, I'm going to ask, how risky are these cash flows? Notice I didn't throw in any terms to kind of buzzwords you throw in there. What's a beta? Those are tools. Don't mistake tools for end games. I need a measure of risk, and I need to bring it into the value. And finally, I'm going to ask, when will your business be a mature business? Because I've got to put some closure on this process. I, can keep, I cannot keep estimating cash flows forever. So those are the four questions around which the valuation swivels. Which then brings me to the way I think about valuation. When I start my valuation class, which doesn't start till Monday, there'll be 200 people who walk into the class. And the first question I ask them is, are you numbers people? Or are you story people? In fact, think about it for a moment. I'll bet, given where I am, that there are more numbers people in this room than story people, right? And the reason I say that is, when I look at investing, you have two camps. You have the numbers people who love to grind through numbers. It's all about the numbers. And if the story people who like to be creative, they like storytelling. The VC business is a storytelling business. I know they throw numbers in like that target rate of return, but it's an afterthought. 
It's a negotiating tool. It's a story game. And the problem right now is the story people think that the numbers people are all geeks. And the numbers people think that the story people are all crazy. And they can't talk to each other. In fact, it's sometimes, it's, it's almost funny to sometimes watch two story people and two numbers people trying to talk about things, and they're talking right past each other. And here's the challenge I see myself having. When I come into that class and there are how many story people and how many numbers people, I ask them actually in a very simple way to see which one you are if you're not sure. I ask them, how many of you enjoyed history in high school? And you'll have 20 people with that. I love that class. Those are the story people. So how many of you preferred algebra to history? That's the numbers people right there. And my end game for my evaluation class is to have numbers people with imagination and story people with discipline. That's the way to think about valuation. If you're a story person, I'm not going to stop you from telling stories. Stories are actually much more effective at selling businesses than numbers are. And it's been true for as long as human beings have been on the earth. So if you tell a story, what I want you to also bring in is enough numbers to discipline yourself because if you don't have the numbers, it's very easy to veer away into fantasy land. If you're a numbers person and you have no imagination, you're not going to be able to do valuation because it's all about the numbers. If you do a good valuation, it should sing a tune. It should tell me a story. That's what I'm looking for. Behind the numbers, what is the story you're telling about a company? So when you look at the two groups, each believes they're the chosen people. The numbers people say, we're the chosen people. We have spreadsheets. We have numbers. We're on the right side of history. And the story people think, oh, you should listen to us. We, have the great, we are the creative people. And I think they're both right and they're both wrong. There's something to be gained from the other side. And to me, that is the key in doing valuation right. You've got to work with both sides of your brain. I don't even know whether this is mythology or not, that there's a left brain and a right brain. But let's face it, some of us prefer to work with numbers, and we have to force ourselves to think about stories. And some of us prefer to tell stories, and we have to force ourselves to think about numbers. Think about your weaker side and work on it, because that's what's going to give you power and valuation. So when I do a valuation, and I use a discounted cash flow evaluation. It's a tool. So when you have DCF being used as a curse word, and venture capitalists have used this on me. You're doing a DCF. And the way they say it, the contempt oozes out of it. <laughs> you can't value this company using a DCF. I think they're completely mis misunderstanding what a discounted cash flow evaluation is. Because <laughs> ultimately, what am I saying? The value of your business is the present value of your expected cash flows from running this business. That's been true for as long as business has been around. We can debate as to whether we can estimate these cash flows, but don't tell me cash flows don't matter, that it doesn't matter whether your company ever makes money. We heard that in the dot-com era, and look at how well that ended. It does matter how much you make. So when I think about a discounted cash flow valuation, a discounted cash flow valuation to me is just a tool to bring in answers to those four questions. My cash flows from existing assets feed in my base year. My value from growth gets fed in through the growth rate I use and how much I'm setting aside to get that growth. My risk is built in through the discount rate, and I bring it to closure by assuming that at some point in time, things settle down, and I can estimate the value of everything that happens after that with this big number at the end. But the DCF is not the end game. It's just a tool to convert your story into a number. So let me use a very simple example to kind of illustrate this. I want to pick somebody who's never done a valuation before, and we're going to do some valuation 101. Anybody here who's never done a valuation before? OK, you can be my guinea pig. I can't move too far away because I have to be on the camera. But this is an empty envelope. I'm not David Copperfield, no magic tricks, no. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a $20 bill. Okay, see, it's a little crumpled, but it's still it's legal tender still. How much should you pay for this envelope? Don't think too long. That's what gets us in trouble. Okay, first rule in valuation, if you pay $20 for an envelope of $20, you get nothing. So let's try again. How much should you pay for this envelope? $10. Go one. You never know what disease I have. I might not be able to read numbers. Okay. First rule in valuation, if you know the value of something, don't throw it on the table. You, want, you know the value of a company. Don't offer that value up front, because then what do you have left for yourself? Put it in your back pocket, start really low, and then build up. 
But this is such a transparent asset to value that if I gave, put it up for a bidding war, my guess is by the end of the bidding, you'd probably get pretty close to 20. Now I'm going to make it interesting. What does this card say? Control. control. I'm going to put control into this envelope. How much did you pay for this envelope now? It's got control in it. <laughs> you know what? I tried this in an investment bank last week. In investment banks, you're trained. If you put a con control into a company, there's a 20% premium. I don't know where that came from. The guy offered me 24. I sold it. <laughs> I, he thought it was a game. I said, no, 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 no. This is a real transaction. Pay me the 24. And so guess what he done? He, he paid $4 for a 3 by 5 card that I stole from NYU that cost me absolutely nothing. This is a money machine. Now that I know you like to pay for 3 by 5 cards with nice sounding words, I can say, Try more. What does it say? Synergy. Synergy. That's a big one. I'll throw that in there. That'll probably go to 26. Okay. What does it say? Brand. Brand name. Oh, big. That's a big one. That's $32 right now. And if that doesn't work, I have my two trump cards. What does it say? Strategic consideration. Strategic. The, that is the most dangerous word. When I hear the word strategic, I'm running out of the door. Because you know what it means? The numbers don't fly, but I really, really, really want to do this. A strategic deal is a really stupid deal. <laughs> but you really want to do this. A strategic buyer is a synonym for a stupid buyer. A buyer who makes up his mind to buy something and then shows up at the table. And here, if nothing else works, here is the trump card that always works. What does it say? China. China. <laughs> Just mention the word. It's amazing how common sense will leave the, through the, the other door. Take a look at earnings reports. Every company that reports it, even the most horrible, at the end they will say, but there's China. Nothing about China, but there's China. <laughs> that alone does it. So China, okay, that, you know, we'll forget all the fact. The fact that you've lost billions doesn't matter. You have China. I call these weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> you know they come out because the numbers don't fly. In fact, I have a very simple test. When I read an analyst report, I count the number of times these words show up. I have a list of a dozen. And the more times these words show up, the less substance there is to that report. Because this is what you use when you can't come up with a real reason for doing something. So here's my first proposition. It's called the it proposition. If it does not affect the cash flows, and it does not affect risk, it cannot affect value. You think, what's it? Whatever it is, control, synergy. I'm not saying control doesn't have value, but if you tell me control has value, tell me what it's going to change. Maybe by controlling this company, you're going to run it differently, generating different cash flows. Maybe by synergy, saying my revenues will grow faster. Let's talk about specifics. You can't let buzzwords drive decisions, because if you let buzzwords drive decisions, you're going to make bad decisions. And worse, you're not going to plan to deliver those because there's nothing behind them. The second proposition I call the duh proposition. I have named it after a subset of emails I get every week. And usually this is how the emails will go. I am valuing a money losing company. I expect it to lose money forever. Which valuation model will work best in valuing this company? I feel like walking up to the person, slapping them around the face and wake up. You're valuing a money losing company, expect to lose money forever. You're thinking about paying for this company. What's wrong with you? Which brings me to a third and final proposition. Next week, when my class starts, I let people pick companies. In fact, I insist that they pick companies. They have to value those companies over the next 14 or 15 weeks, over the semester. They can pick whatever company they want. They can pick Luke Oil, they can pick Google, they can pick Amazon. And sometime in the first or the second week, a subset of people, not everybody in the class, thank God, but 10 of them will show up saying, I have to change my company. I say, it's a little early, why are you panicking? So, well, I worked out the cash flows for my company, and they're negative. And you said in the dirt proposition, the cash flows are negative, you can't value a company. And I said, not, that's not what I said. I said, the cash flows are negative forever, you can't value the company. But if your cash flows are negative in year one, year two, year three, it's not the end of the world. In fact, there are a subset of companies when you value the company, you should get negative cash flows up front. What types of companies will you get negative cash flows up front? Young growth companies, and here's why. To grow, what do you have to do? 
you got to put money back into the business. There is no magic bullet that you can use to grow at 80% a year. So if I'm valuing a Tesla, I should expect to see negative cash flows up front. Why? Because you've got to build those assembly plants to deliver those 10 times more cars I expect you to sell five years from now. But if you have negative cash flows up front, you've got to have disproportionately large positive cash flows in the future. You see why they have to be disproportionately large? You lose a billion in year one. You've got to make up for it with 10 billion in year 10. So with young growth companies, that's exactly what you should expect to see. You should see negative cash flows up front because that's what you need to grow the company. And as the company matures, nirvana shows up. Cash flows turn positive, you get the big values, but that's okay. So here's one way to think about the search for valuation. You sit down to value a company. You pull up the financials, right? Annual report, 10K, 10Q. That'll give you a sense of what this company did last year. And if you have a mature company, that might be all you need because they're so set in their path that you can pretty much value the company using last year's financials. But if you have a company that's in transition in a market that's changing, you have to collect information about how the market is evolving, who the competitors are. When you think about risk, you're going to look at the past, you're going to look at the future. You're, you're going to be looking at every piece of information. And be, my only suggestion if you value business is don't do a blind Google search. You know what I mean? So, if you say, if for instance, I have to value Uber. If I type in Uber in Google, you know what I get? Everything ever said about Google on the face of the earth. When you search, you want focused searches. In other words, you first figure out what you're looking for, and then you go looking for it. In fact, what I do is I open up an Excel spreadsheet with the inputs I need, and with each one, I say, this is the number I'm looking for right now. I'm not going to get distracted, even if I find something interesting about something else for the moment. I'm going to stay focused on it. So if I'm looking at the risk in a company, that's all I'm looking for. Are there any clues I can get by looking at the company, the market, and the competitors about that risk? And at the end of the process, I'm keeping my eyes on the price. This is not about getting more information. It's about taking data and converting into information. We live in a world where we have too much data. That's the reality we face. Our job is to take the data and compress it in information that actually shows up in evaluations. So here's a simple example of evaluation of a very boring company. We all know what 3M does, right? Incredibly sophisticated stuff like the post-it note. But don't laugh, it's an incredibly profitable product. It's a company with a long history, and this is a valuation I did at 3M in what I call the days of innocence the days when there were developed markets on one side and emerging markets on the other, and never the twain shall meet, pre-2008. So it was a mature company in what I thought was a mature market. In hindsight, I was hopelessly wrong. But my point is, in valuing 3M, I had to make estimates, but those estimates were easy to make. Why? Because there was a lot of history I could use. I knew what their business model was. I didn't have to figure out what they would do in the future. So it's a valuation that was centered, there was uncertainty, but the uncertainty was much smaller. The, the way to think about it, if you think about narrative and numbers, in the case of 3M, the story's almost done. You're in chapter 33. There's not much room for you to change the story. You can't go back and rewrite the story. So this is a valuation that you can do almost in autopilot. And this is the kind of company that you're taught to value in a valuation class in school. And I have some really bad news for you. If this is the kind of company you can value, anybody can value these companies. In fact, I'm not even sure you need a body. I have, in, fa in fact, uh, how many of you have Apple devices or is that not allowed in Google? Right? If you have an Apple device, go to the iTunes store and type in new value. It's an app that I co-developed with a friend of mine, Anand Sundaram at Dartmouth, that does valuation. So you download it, you plug in the numbers. For the, you know, it's a, your flight is 30 minutes delayed, you know, you have nothing to do, you're one of those freakish people who likes to work with numbers, you put in nine numbers, you value a company, you move on. Okay? And I wrote it because I want to disrupt this valuation business, because so much of what you pay for in valuation is a banker feeding numbers into something like that, and then spending 25 days making it look like he did a lot of other stuff and then charging you millions of dollars for something he has no business charging you millions for. So if you're valuing 3M or companies like that, you don't need an appraiser. You don't need a banker. Anybody should be able to value those companies. 
But let's talk about more interesting companies. It's a valuation I did of Apple in March of 2013. It's a, I've actually valued Apple every three months forever. But since 2010, I've been public about my valuations. What I mean by that is on my blog, which is a Google blog, so it's a good thing about it, I guess. Okay. I post my valuation of Apple because I don't believe in high, I mean, I, the way I describe it is I'd rather be transparently wrong than opaquely right. And in this business, people want to be opaquely right. What, they, what, what I mean by that is that you, they will say things that are so difficult for you to construe that no matter what happens, they can say, I told you so. <laughs> and it drives me crazy. So what I do is I say, this is what I think the value of Apple is. And of course, I'm going to be wrong, but at least you can see where I went wrong. So this is a evaluation I, 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 I did of Apple in March of 2013, because every time a new earnings report comes out, I revalue the company. So I'm due for one very soon, because Apple's earnings report just came out last week. What I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate here, though, is in valuation, traditional valuation, here's how you value a company. You make best case, uh, you, you basically, not even best case, you make your expected value estimates for things like cash flows and growth and risk. Point estimates. So I ask you what the growth is, you give me a number. You ask me what the risk is, you give me a number. But the reality is, if you think about it, is you face uncertainty, right? You have a distribution in your head and I'm forcing you to give me a number. And part of you is saying, it's 8%, but it could be 3 it could be 11 and 25 years ago, I can see why you were stuck. You had to do that because we did not have the tools to actually bring in uncertainty. I actually have crystal ball attached to my Excel. If any of you use crystal ball, it's a simulation add-on to Excel. And what it allows you to do is enter a distribution for your assumptions rather than a single number. So if I'm valuing a company like Apple, rather than give one number, I can give you a distribution. So rather than say revenue growth is 6%, I can say it's uniformly distributed between 3 and 9. And the more uncertainty you feel, the wider the distribution is going to be. And if any, if any of you have done a simulation, here's what happens. A computer goes pick, picks one outcome out of each simulation and does a valuation. Crystal Ball's default is 100,000 simulations. This is what my simulated value for Apple was in March of 2013. See, what is that? How does that help me? The stock price was 450. In my base case valuation, I got about 580. So I could give you the base case value. So I think Apple is undervalued, but your defense will be, but you could be wrong. Of course I could be wrong. But what the distribution shows you is how wrong I can be. And if I'm a decision maker, I'd much rather base it on a richer set of information because here's what I can tell you about Apple. I can give you an expected value like I did before. I can also tell you if you pay 450, what the chance you are wrong up front is. I can give you an ex ante probability. There's a 21% chance you could be wrong. All I have to do is count the number of values below 450. And I put up a distribution and in April of, in March of 2013, based on my valuation, I said, I know I can be hopelessly wrong on my inputs, but based on the outcomes, it looks like there's a 90% chance. You see where the 90% comes from? The 10th percent percentile is about $450. The stock is trading at $450. Investing is a game of odds, and it looks to me, based on my assessments, that the odds are in my favor. And of course, this is an investment that's worked out hopelessly well in some cases. Hopelessly well, because the stock is now, what, 840 with the 7 to 1 <coughs> split. Not everything works out that well. But my, my, what I'm trying to say is don't let uncertainty stop you. And especially in the technology business, I find this defense to be very troubling. You ask people, why are you not valuing this company? Because there's too much uncertainty. What does that mean? Your estimates could be wrong, but that doesn't mean you can't make an estimate. Saying that there's too much uncertainty, do, do a valuation, and then investing in the company, to me is the height of insanity. And lots of venture capitalists go through that cycle over and over again. They say, I don't want to value the company, but I'll invest in the company. You can't tell me one thing and do the other. So if you cannot value the company, at least do the logical thing and never invest in those companies. But if you want to invest in young growth companies, you have to get your hands around those numbers and make your best estimates. Now, of course, with a young startup, all these questions become more difficult to answer, right? If you're the founder of a young startup, let me ask you the four questions to which I, know, to which I need answers. And you're going to see why life is so much more difficult. 
First question, what are your cash flows from existing assets? You have a young startup. What's the answer to the question? What, what assets? I have nothing. I'm sitting on a chair. I don't even own it. OK, that was easy. <laughs> then I ask you, how much value do you think future growth will bring in? You say, a lot. <laughs> so can you be a little more specific? Not really. I don't even have a business model yet. Then I say, how risky are you? Very. <laughs> but you can't give me past prices and earnings because you haven't been around. I say, when will you be a mature company and you fall on the ground laughing? You, you, you might not even make it through tomorrow. Every question becomes like pulling teeth. And that's why with young startups, people give up. My suggestion is rather than give up, make your best estimates. Don't put the weight of the world on your shoulders saying, I have to be right. You cannot be right, but you can still make estimates. For the last four years, every time you've had a big IPO come up, the week before the IPO, I try to value the IPO. The reason I do it the week before the IPO is you wait till the IPO is priced, it in, that, that number starts gnawing away at your brain. So when you do a valuation, your number starts to wander towards that number. So this is actually a valuation I did at Twitter the week before the IPO. So I, what triggered this was I was in CNBC. So once in a while, I end up in that insanity. And I was actually. You know, we were talking about Twitter, and you know, there was an analyst there who was very optimistic about Twitter, and he said, so I said, why do you think Twitter's worth so much? He thought it was worth 65 or $70 per share. He said, because the online advertising business is huge. So I said, how big is the online advertising business? He said, I don't know, but it's huge. And this is exactly what gets us into trouble, is people don't want to talk. It's like China, <laughs> right? Online, it's huge. So because it's huge, I can pay whatever I want. So I said, you know what, if I want to value Twitter, that's where I need to start. I need to figure out how big this business is. It didn't take a whole lot of research to figure this out, but the entire online advertising business in 2013 was about 120 billion. That's a whole global online advertising business. The biggest player by far is, is Google, right next to it. And if you look at the breakdown, you can see Google is about 33% of the global online advertising. The next biggest is Facebook, and then you have a splintered business. So that's the business right now. I do know that online advertising is becoming a larger and larger portion of overall advertising. Print media is going out of, you know, out of style. So here's what I had to do first to value Twitter. I had to figure out how big this market was going to be because it, before I talk about what the revenues for Twitter are going to be, I need to figure out what they're aiming for, right? So I made some assumptions. I assume that the overall advertising market, which is about 550 billion, so about 20% of all advertising is online right now, that the overall advertising market can grow only about 3% a year because it's an expense to companies. They can't grow it at 10% a year. But online advertising would increase as a percentage of that to become about 40% of the market. That gave me my end game. It gave me my online advertising market a decade from now. It's about 200 billion. I made it up, and I made it up on the following basis. I looked at how quickly existing advertising media revenues are dropping. Print advertising is falling through the floor, but TV advertising has actually been surprisingly robust. So it's, there are certain kinds of advertising where I think you're going to see other advertising. Billboard advertising is not going to go away, because if you're driving, it's tough to have online ads. Maybe you figure something out, right? <laughs> But you have a lot of accidents flying. So, so I made that assumption. And clearly, that's where you and I can have different values for Twitter. But at least we're talking about substance. So if you made a stand saying, I think it's going to be 60% of the market, OK. So you'll have to go marshal the ammunition for that. So I use 40%. And then I had to make a judgment as to what percentage of that market Twitter would capture. That's tough, right? You've all seen how Twitter ads work, right? That sponsored tweet that shows up pisses me off no end. <laughs> I've never clicked on a sponsored tweet. I hope nobody ever does. Okay? But that's the way they make their advertising revenues. And that's their strength and their weakness. Their strength is 140 characters. Their weakness is 140 characters. That's their strength because it makes it nice, compact. You know? The weakness is it can't be your primary advertising. So the way I see it is even if Twitter succeeds, it'll never be a Google or a Facebook. It'll be, a, it'll be a lesser player. And that led me to use a market share of about 6% for Twitter, which is still about $12 billion. Here's a company with a half a billion dollars in revenues right now. And over the next decade, I'm assuming it's going to go 24-4 to 12 billion. So that gave me half the game. 
I then have to figure out how much money they will make once they're past this growth phase. And there are two big targets here. One is Google and the other is Facebook. Both are immensely profitable. Google's margins are about 22% of revenues. Facebook's are about 30%. I, and Facebook's margins are dropping each year that you watch them because as they get bigger, it's tougher and tougher to maintain. These are, these are immense margins. But I thought I was being optimistic when I used to 25% end margin for Twitter. I said, that's what you're shooting for. So I've got my revenues in year 10. I've got my margins in year 10. I also had to bring in that final piece, which is, this isn't going to happen by magic. You're not going to go from half a billion revenues to 12 billion without doing something. So I'd estimate how much they would have to put back into the business in acquisitions, new technology. That's the reinvestment I'm getting, and I'm computing it based on how much their revenues are changing each year. Those three pieces give me my cash flows. The small revenues become big revenues. The losses become profits. The reinvestment gives them the engine to drive the revenue growth. That was what I spent the bulk of my time on. Most people who do discounted cash flow valuation, there are two parts of DCF, discounted cash flow valuation. There's a D and the CF. The D is the discount rate. Here's my problem with the way DCFs are done. 80% of the time that most analysts spend is on the D. They'll finesse it to the nth decimal point. 20% is on cash flow. I'll make a confession, the Twitter valuation, 97% of the time that I spent was on the cash flow. And towards the end, I need a discount rate. And for the discount rate, what I effectively used was a discount rate, I'm sorry, of, of, of about 11%. And I didn't think about it too much. 11% puts you in the 95th percentile of US companies. So I'm basically saying they're a really risky company. I could finesse this a little more, but I really don't care. This is really the small stuff. My bigger assumption is what my revenues will be, what my margins will be. This is not where I'm going to screw up. And I also have to factor in that with a young company, there's a chance that they will not make it. In the case of Twitter, I assumed that there was zero chance that they would not make it because they have access to capital. It's not that they won't screw up, but they seem to have access to people who will keep giving them money even if they screw up. And that's a nice skill to have. Those are the things that fed into my valuation of Twitter. And in the week before the IPO, the value that I put was 18. And if you remember your history, it was priced at 26. And on the offering day, it didn't even open for about two hours. And when it did open, it opened at 46. And I got a call from somebody saying, how do you explain the 46? And I said, I don't have to. I didn't pay it. <laughs> I've never felt the urge to explain what some other person pays. So, eighteen dollars per share. Yeah. So I get called saying, "How do you explain Uber's forty-one billion? Ask somebody who paid the forty-one billion. I didn't do it. <laughs> okay. I just take Uber once in a while, but I'm not paying forty-one billion to my driver. Okay. So I don't feel the urge to try to explain it. In fact, that's one final thing I want to say. Much of what you see passing for valuation out there is really pricing. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, let me give you a couple of very simple tests. How many of you own a house or an apartment? What, Google doesn't pay you enough to buy your own apartment? <laughs> right? Time to raise your salary, so I, uh, I'll make sure that that happens. Okay? You know how this works, right? How, what do you do? You hire a realtor, the realtor shows you a house. I'm, I'm thinking of moving to La Jolla, especially after two winters, like I'm done. 20, 28 winters in New York, I'm out of here. My wife's from California, I'm going back, I went to UCLA, I can't take this anymore. So. I talked about this with my wife, and the minute I said it, she's checking out houses. <laughs> hey, this is when we think, and, and she picks the most expensive part of California. Look, La Jolla. This is a slum in La Jolla. It's, it's less than a million. That shows it's one of the cheapest houses probably in La Jolla. But here's my question. How did the realtor come up with that 995000 for the house? How does a realtor come up with a number for an apartment? What does she or she do? She looks at other apartments, or he looks at other units that sold in the neighborhood, <coughs> adjust for the fact that you have an extra bedroom or a bigger lot. It's pricing. There's no valuation going on. You're saying those unsophisticated realtors. Let me show you a second. You've seen an equity research report? If you haven't, save yourself the trouble. Because here's what the analysts will do. You'd say you'll pay, there'll be a company name. There'll be a multiple, which is like a standardized price, like a price per square foot, a price earnings ratio. There'll be 15 other companies that the analyst claims are just like your company. In what universe, I don't know. I've seen Google equity research reports. 
These 15 companies are just like Google. I look like, oh, really? It's amazing. How do you find those? I would argue that the realtor was on much firmer ground looking at apartments around the neighborhood than an equity research analyst trying to find 15 companies like Google. But that's exactly what the equity research analyst is doing, is pricing your company based on what comparable companies trade at. Though there's nothing comparable about them. You're seeing those unsophisticated equity research analysts. You sometimes see a discounted, this looks like one of those discounted, if you, if you pay a banker, this is what you get, cash flows. The next time you see a valuation from a banker, zero in on the biggest number in a discounted cash flow valuation, it's always the end number, the value at the end of year five. Take a look at where that number comes from, and I'll wager in nine out of 10 banking valuations, that number comes from applying a multiple to year five number. What do I mean by that? They'll take the, in this case, here's what I did. I took the operating income in year five and multiplied by 10. You say, why 10? Because that's what other companies trade at right now. I can tell you all kinds of stories, but this is a pricing as well. I'm just hiding it in year five. I call these pricing and drag. The drag component is the cash flows, right? While you're distracted by the cash flows, you slip in 10 times, EBIT. That's what's driving this number. Most of what passes for valuation out there is pricing. You think, so what? It's a very different game. The price, what sets prices? It's demand and supply, mood and momentum. What sets value? Cash flows, growth, and risk. Could the two give you different answers? Absolutely. If you're a trader, not a trader, but a trader, you care about prices. What's CNBC? CNBC is, is, is an instrument for trade. You, you are trading the stock. All you care about is what moves prices. So the only question I'm asking is what's the mood, what's the momentum, where is it going? So if you ask me to explain why people are paying 41 billion for Uber, you know why? Because they think they can sell it for 75 billion. That's basically it. That they think that they can take it in a public offering for 75 billion. Are they right? If the momentum continues, they could very well be right. Does that mean that Uber is, has, has a value of 75 billion? That's a very different question. Sometimes price and value can diverge, and if they diverge, they can give you very different numbers. The social media space is, is a pricing space. In fact, if you ask me why social media companies trade at what they do, I have a very simple answer. It's not because of how much they made in revenues, it's not because how much money they make. Thank God for that, because most of them make no money. So here's what I did. I decided to let the data tell me what drove the pricing. And here's what I, uh, what I did to answer the question. I took every social media company, it's easy to get the public information, what the market value is, and then I collected all the information I could about these companies, what they had in revenues, what they had in earnings. What I was trying to figure out is how is the market pricing these companies? What is it using to come up with the prices? And I drew on statistics to answer that. All I did was a correlation between the market cap and different variables to see which one had the highest correlation with the market. So what is it that makes some social media companies valuable and the others not? And you can look across the correlations and by far, look at that, look at the correlation. The most critical variable in explaining the market value of a social media company is the number of users. I'll give you a very simple way to value social media company. Here again, you could save yourself the trouble of hiring a banker. You tell me how many users you have. And if you go back to the previous page, the market's paying about $100 per user. You tell me how many users you have. I'll tell you what your value is going to be in the company. So how many users does Twitter have? 250 million. 250 million times 100 is 25 billion. We're done. Who cares about cash flows, growth, and risk? Facebook has 175 billion users. A million, million users. They wish they had 175 billion. What planets are you going on to, right? 175, you know, 1.75 billion users. You multiply that by 100, you get $175 billion. And remember last year when Facebook bought WhatsApp? How many of you have WhatsApp on your phones? How many of you pay for your WhatsApp? That settles my case, like one in five people. In fact, last year when they bought WhatsApp, they paid, what, 20 billion for the company? 19 billion seems to have rounded up to 21. Don't ask me how those things happen. It's just a couple of billions anyway. I got a call again saying, how do you, for some reason people think I have to explain what other people do. <laughs> how do you explain what Facebook, uh, no, just did? 
And I said, you're missing the point. Facebook is not buying WhatsApp for the earnings, the cash flows, and the revenues. What are they doing? How many users did Facebook, uh, did WhatsApp have? When, like 400 million. Even if you allow for the fact that about 80 or 100 million of those are already Facebook users, you're buying 300 million new users. If the market's paying $100 per user, 300 million times 100 is 30 billion. You're paying, you're getting a bargain. <laughs> Don't laugh. This game is going crazy right now. People are buying users because that's what the market is rewarding. You're saying, what's wrong with that? Markets are fickle. Today they like users. Tomorrow they might not. Remember they like website visitors for a long time till they said, you know what, I can't pay dividends with website visitors. It's time to say, I'll take three visitors, please. Send them to my house. They'll work around. <laughs> I paid a lot of money for your stock. At some point, they're going to ask for substance. The way I describe social media companies, it's like having a gigantic store with nothing on the shelves and lots of foot traffic. That's what you're buying. What are you hoping for? That if you put something on the shelves, maybe they'll stop and buy it. It's not an unreal exercise. It's called it a field of dreams. Remember Kevin Costner? He says, if, you, you know, the shoeless, if, if we build it, he will come. Shoeless, it's the same thing. If we have the users, it will come. How it will come, I don't know, but it will come. But that's what pricing is about. It's not about what you and I think matters. It's what the market is building in. Which brings me to my last point. And I hate to be the one to break this. This is a game where luck is the dominant paradigm. When I say this, I'm talking about investing, venture capital investing, regular investing. We like to think it's skill and hard work. It's luck. If you're lucky, you can do horribly sloppy things and be incredibly rich. If you're not, doesn't matter how well you do things, you're still going to lose money. If you're lucky, all else is forgiven. And all too often when people make money, they like to claim it's skill. For a while, the hedge fund managers were saying this, right? We're skillful guys. We're the smartest people in the room. Says who? I don't think there's a, uh, when people talk about smart money, I always cringe. There is no smart money. There's less stupid money and more stupid money, but there's really no smart money. And in fact, the best evidence that there is no smart money in hedge funds is what's happened collectively to the hedge fund business. You know how hedge funds work, right? First, they take 2% of your money up front. Then they take 20% of whatever your upside is. It's a horrendously bad setup. But you do it because you're greedy. You think they can deliver more than the market? Collectively, hedge funds deliver about one percentage point less than what you could make by putting your money in an S&P 500 index fund. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange business. I can't think of it. The analogy would be starting a plumbing business called Floods Are Us. And here's what you do. There's a leak in your house. You call me and I leave a flood. <laughs> you would never call me back, right? That's what we do collectively with these hedge funds. We pay them tons of money to do what? Earn less than what we could have made by not paying them. You figure it out, because I certainly can't. So here's my final point about valuation. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, The Wizard of Oz. Remember the story? Dorothy gets sucked out of Kansas. She gets dumped in Oz. She wants to go back to Kansas. Don't ask me why. I've stayed in Oz. <laughs> hey. So of course, the movie starts with, you know, I need to go back. And of course, she's given the classic advice. Go meet the Wizard of Oz. He has all the answers. And the entire movie is about her going in the yellow brick road and this motley crew of characters she collects, right? The, the scarecrow who needs this and a tin man, the lion. And they all get to Oz expecting the wizard to be this all-powerful person to, who grant. They walk into the chamber. They each tell the wizard what they want. And the wizard has this deep voice until the curtain drops. And you realize it's the small guy behind the curtain who's been pulling that there's really no Wizard of Oz. But it turns out that they all got what they needed during the course of the journey. You see, what's this got to do with valuation? I firmly believe that you learn valuation by doing. You really want to learn valuation. Here's what you need to do. Value a company. First time you do it, it'll be like pulling teeth. Then value another company. It's different from the first company as you get. So next week, I'm putting up a valuation. It's a crowd valuation of Uber post that I did on my website where I, at each stage I ask you to decide what Uber is. Is it a car service company or a transportation company? Is it a local networking benefit or a global networking benefit? I can tell you my story, but I want, and at the end of the process, I say, based on your story, this is 
Uber's value. And the value for Uber ranges anywhere from 800 million to 95 billion, depending on the story you tell. When we get big differences in value, it's not because our numbers are different, it's because we have different narratives. Not all of these narratives are equally likely, and that's really the question you gotta ask, is what is the right narrative for my company? I promised I would not talk about Google, but I will leave you with this thought. If you're thinking about Google as a company going forward, as an investor, here's the question I'm asking. What is the narrative I'm telling about this company? What do I see this company doing? Because that's what's going to drive the valuation of, Uber, of, of Google, not the fact that because of exchange rate movements, you did not deliver the growth you did. Who cares? In the larger scheme of things, th those things don't change your narrative. If investors react to it, let them react to it. This is about telling a story and delivering the kinds of decisions that back up that story. That's about it. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I have a couple of minutes to answer the questions. Yes. How, do you, how would you do it? I mean, this is, this is an inc it's like nailing jello to a wall. And here's what I mean by that. It's a very noisy process. This is a distribution at a point in time. If I move forward a month and I redo the distribution, the entire distribution will shift. It's really not about the distribution of value. It's about value versus price. Okay? So what you can look at is, if you're right about value, is the price moving towards the value. Okay? In the case of Apple, it turned out that it did. But I would take, it's a sample of one. So that is, it, it's almost an article of faith. If you're an investor, you believe that ultimately price move, moves towards value. There's no guarantee that it will. So if you do your job, you collect the information, you make your best judgment, you estimate a value in a distribution, and you decide based on it to buy something, what you're checking to see is not whether the value gets delivered, but whether the price move to, moves towards the value. And I believe it does, and that's why I stick with it. But you know, it's, it's, it's a fact-based process. If it doesn't work, Need to let it go. Yeah. Yes. Was it ever proven that price moves towards the value? Like Was it how again? You know, ultimately, reality. Th there is a reality here, which is businesses. I can perception is fine. If you're if you're valuing a Picasso or pricing a Picasso, it's all perception, right? If tomorrow we all woke up and said the guy can't paint, he's got a, you know nose in the wrong place. But a business is, can't be all perception. So for, price can deviate from value for extended periods. It's not a question of whether it moves to value, it's when it does. And that's really the debate. There are some people who say it takes so long to happen that there's no point even waiting for it. Those are the traders. They say, well, look, I'm going to make money in the next, if your time horizon is six months, don't even waste your time thinking about value. You have to play the pricing game. So it's almost a given when you play the investor game that you have a longer time horizon. Yes. Oh, so Google a lot of times when we are thinking about valuation first because we're thinking about acquisition. Um, how do you like mix in the concept of I'm going to bring this whole team on board and like how do you incorporate that into the valuation? Well, I think at the right. See, I'll, I'll tell you what I think about uh, about acquisitions in general, rather than speak about Google. At the right price, I don't care who you buy. At the wrong price, I don't care who you buy. Basically, at the right price, you can buy the worst possible target, and you're going to come out ahead. At the wrong price, you can do everything right, but you're already screwed. Okay? I think in acquisitions, the problem I see is that we spend too much time on finding the right target and doing all that neat stuff where we fit stuff, and too little time asking, what are we paying for that? You're right, after the acquisition, there's all that post-acquisition work you have to do to deliver, especially if you're talking about synergies, because that's often what drives your acquisitions. Um, or yeah, or whatever additional value you create. So that requires that you take the strengths of the company you've acquired and add it on to the, your strengths to deliver it. That requires work. And that's, I think, the bottom line. It's not going to happen magically. And that's why I'd prefer that it be done before the acquisition, that you start putting plans down of what you're going to do before the acquisition rather than wait after the fact and say, oh my God, this is not going to work. So if you've got an acquisition process, it's got to be disciplined. And it'll work only if you're willing to walk away from the table, even if it was the best target you've ever found, but the price is too high. Okay? If you're never willing to walk away from the table, you are going to overpay over and over again. And in too many big companies, 
the problem I see is that the company decides it's going to do an acquisition and then goes to the bargaining table. You're in terrible position to bargain if you've already decided you're going to do this. Right? Last question, then I'm going to stop. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Uh, so I should, I was curious. You know, what is your take on uh, you know an individual investor who's uh, you know people like us who have maybe full time jobs who are not and and a lot of us are not MBAs and not students of valuation and the traditional sort of conventional advisors to buy an index fund. I, I was just curious, do you endorse that or, or for someone who's interested in learning things, what do you recommend? Well, uh, investing takes work. And if you don't have the time for that work, it's probably best not to put yourself at risk by doing something because you heard somebody say it, right? So my suggestion is go with a low, time-intensive investment strategy. It doesn't always have to be an index fund. It, can be, it has to be some kind of, you've you got to spread your bets, okay? And don't overreach. You don't get rich by investing. You get rich by doing whatever you're doing, and investing is about preserving what you made elsewhere and growing it. It's when you get greedy about trying to make that killing on your investment that you tend to overreach. Okay? So I have to stop there. Unfortunately, I have a 418 train. I, I, I wish this were not true. I'd have normally stayed till 5 o'clock. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.